Welcome to our weekly feature, The Political View. Well, as former President Jacob Zuma continues to fight his corruption charges, one of the whistleblowers who contributed to his downfall is returning to Parliament for the first time since 2014. Back in 1999, 20 years ago this year, Patricia DeLille, then a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress, led the call for an investigation into alleged corruption in South Africa's purchase of weapons from Britain and European arms manufacturers. Today, she's preparing to return as the leader and a member of Parliament for the Good Party party after two terms as mayor of Cape Town are with the Democratic Alliance. Patricia DeLille joins us from our Cape Town studios. Patricia, good evening to you. Thank you for coming in tonight. Good evening. You ended up with two seats in the National Assembly after those elections 10 days ago. You've had some time to consider your result. How do you feel about it all now? Uh, Steve, over, we feel very grateful and we're humbled uh, by the support that we received. Uh, it's a victory for us since we only started four months ago. We now have a mandate um, on which we put forward to the voters a plan to fix South Africa uh, and to continue the fight for social justice, economic justice, spatial justice and also environmental justice. So with that mandate uh, we will then also prioritize uh, the issues that we want to take up and for me, the first priority is how do we deal with poverty? Poverty has got a face in this country, and that is the face of a woman of color. And the feminization of poverty must be addressed, and we must make sure that government begin to acknowledge uh, the feminization of poverty. Stats SA has just confirmed that 31% of women of color are unemployed. And so I will make sure that I fight uh, for better uh, programs, but also where women are employed in the labor market, you also find that women don't receive equal work, I mean equal pay for equal work. My second priority of course will be to continue my fight for spatial justice. Uh, public land must be used for public good and we will be identifying those pieces of land that government can build houses and create opportunities for poor people closer to, uh, to, to the cities. And then of course I've already started a corruption desk um, whereby I want people to forward uh, corruption allegations to me. I've so far received five emails already and uh, those are the key things that I will be concentrating with a mandate in Parliament. You will have just two seats in the National Assembly. There'll be 398 yes. other people, Patricia. How are you going to make your voice heard? I mean, I'm not worried that you won't be able to, but how do you plan to do it? Well, you know, it's not the numbers that produce quality. Uh, you know, you can be one person and it's the input. We are planning to be a very constructive opposition, positive because we want to see our country succeed. We want to build a good country. And that is why we will be prioritizing the issues that we are going to take up. There are many ways in, in which you can uh, um, make your voice heard in Parliament. Members of Parliament must never forget that we are there to provide oversight over the executive and need to hold the executive to account. Uh, it's how you do it that will make the impact. And I certainly have been there for 15 years and I'm returning with all of that experience. It's a lot of experience, but there's still a lot of other voices. I mean, as I say, there are just two of you. Uh, are you able to share any, any of your tactics? You'd have to really use quite novel tactics to try and get heard, I think, in the sixth parliament. Well, you, you mustn't be intimidated by uh, noises. Uh, we already seized with a very male-dominated uh, uh, leadership in parliament, very toxic masculinity. And, and all of those things must never intimidate you. For me, it is about asking the critical questions. That if government has got a plan and parliament approve a budget, you then have to monitor to make sure and ask one question. What are they not doing that they are supposed to be doing in terms of their own plans? 
And in that way, you raise issues, not just criticizing, but say, uh, showing up the failings of government. Because we have had enough of plans. We now need to see implementation of those plans and we need to monitor the implementation. Of course, we have got a proposal of a lot of plans how to fix South Africa, and we will be using those examples. Um, how would you describe the situation in your political party now? You've just won two seats in an election. Do you consider yourself a unified organization? Yes, we know we're four months old. We have agreed when we started the election campaign uh, that we've Say got interim again. leadership structures, yes. that we will be, uh, within the next 18 months, we will be going for our first National Congress after we have built the structures. Uh, there are many new people in the party, and now is the time to consolidate uh, all the good people that have joined us and have, have bought into the plan of building a, a, a good South Africa. As I understand it, your chair in Tabi Singh de Porco actually resigned today. What's your reaction to that? Well, I have been told about it later this afternoon that, that, that she has resigned and I want to wish her well. Uh, she was part of our campaign. Uh, you know, there are many people who are not happy because they didn't get seats. Uh, but we had said in the beginning already that, you know, we will be happy with any seats that we receive. And we've already uh, started to plan our strategy to participate in the 2021 local government elections. So I will be speaking to her in the morning, but I want to wish her well with her future endeavours. Many smaller parties like yours have come along and they're, they've, they're often called, often unfairly, one-person parties. Sometimes they, they are one-person parties and sometimes they're not. Um, what tends to happen is that there is a claim at some point against the leader that the leader is behaving dictatorially. Just, just for the record, you're not behaving in such a manner, you're behaving democratically in your party? Well, you know, in four months, Stephen, I have just been campaigning across the country. Uh, in every town and every city. And now that after the elections, we will be able to start building those structures, branch structures, where people can participate fully in the, uh, in the party. And, that's, and that is my task for the next 18 months, to build uh, a good, uh, to become a force to be reckoned with. You know, all parties start somewhere. Uh, and we started four months ago, and we're going to continue to build on that now. Patricia, um, if I can bring up some of your history, I mean, it's, it's not entirely ancient history, although it did happen 20 years ago. It was 1999 that you revealed the infamous, well, famous perhaps is a better word, arms deal dossier. You read it into the parliamentary record. And today one of the big stories is around the arms deal, the challenge by former President Jacob Zuma to his prosecution. Um, based on everything you know about the arms deal, do you think he has a strong case against being prosecuted now? Yes, Sivova, it's almost 20 years ago. It was on the 9th of September 1999 when I went to Parliament and asked uh, President Thabo Mbeki to establish a judicial commission of inquiry and that uh, one of the people, uh, President, Deputy President Jacob Zuma, has also been implicated. Now, for 20 years, um, the allegations that I have put forward in Parliament uh, has been tested in a court of law. Shabir Sheikh was found guilty and prosecuted. Tony Angeni was found guilty and prosecuted. We've never really got to uh, testing the merits of the allegations against former President Jacob Zuma. Because for the past 20 years, he's always brought up some technicality in law, including established the Sarichi Commission of Inquiry, with a predetermined outcome that they were, the finding must be that there was no corruption in the arms deal. Um, President, uh, former president always said that they wanted his day in court, but we know for the past 20 years uh, he's been trying to avoid his day in court. I'm a witness in, in his trial and they've asked me whether I will come and give evidence again and of course I, I have agreed. Um, but really, it sends out a, a wrong signal. Uh, 
you know, in a country where we are struggling with corruption, the scourge of corruption, that it's sending the wrong message that it's okay to be corrupt. But the principle for me here is that, that we must stand by, and that is that we are all equal before the law. And therefore, the, the request today uh, to, to drop the case because of the timeline, I think President Zuma only have got himself to blame for delaying the matter for so long. Patricia, you of course testified in the prosecution of Shabir Sheikh. I remember watching you in the Durban High Court at the time. Yes. Sheikh was found guilty, of course. Do you believe that the evidence you would bring would be roughly the same? Sheikh was found guilty of making the payments to Zuma. Zuma is now accused of receiving the payments. Would your evidence be roughly on the same lines as, as what he told the Durban High Court then? Yes, it, it will be the same because it is the same evidence um, that uh, came up in the Durban High Court. Uh, I think, like, like in any corruption dealies, there's, there are always two, takes two to tango. Um, and, and, and in this case, um, the court ruled against the person who's actually given the money, but he's given the money to somebody else. And that is why it is so important that President Jacob Zuma must be afforded uh, to state his side of the case, that he must get a fair trial, that he must have a right to appeal, and all of that um, must happen, to, happen to, to President Zuma, but uh, we can't delay it any longer. Patricia, at the beginning of the interview, you said that the main things that you would like your party good to push for are to change, for example, South Africa's lived experience, spatial development, apartheid spatial development is probably the correct phrase. Yes. Um, you also talked about the feminization of poverty. To, to reduce those, to change those, requires really quite big interventions by government. What kind of policies would you espouse? What kind of policies do you think we as a country should follow to change those? And we're talking about going against hundreds of years of history. Well, Steve, over my, my experience as, as the mayor of the city of Cape Town, uh, where I, I can produce tried and tested solutions, and the first thing is that all three spheres of government must identify those well-located pieces of land close by transport, close by opportunity, because poor people spend more than 40% of their income just to travel. And that public land must be used for public good. And, and certainly my first question in Parliament will be uh, uh, to national government, for instance, to release all the army-based land uh, with, with in, in the major cities. We don't need the army to be in the center of a city. We can release that land for affordable housing. And, and just before I, I resigned as the mayor, I wasn't fired for the record. <laughs> uh, I have released some land, uh, uh, city-owned land for affordable housing. And I think it's an indictment on all of us in this country that after 25 years, we've not dealt with the apartheid spatial planning. So I think that is going to be the easy one because then it's up to the different spheres of government, provincial or local or national, to say, no, we can't release that land. But we know exactly where those pieces of land are. And um, I think all governments will, will agree that we can no longer just buy that cheap land outside of the cities, outside of the towns, and then continue to build the rubbish that we are, are building for people. So um, it's, for, it's going to be very interesting. I've, I've got a number of pieces of land. I've got a, a list of a number of buildings owned by, by the state that can be transformed into affordable housing. You can imagine the um, reaction of some of the middle classes, Patricia, if you were to do that. So, for example, would you look at, say, parks that exist in cities, in Joe Biggle, Cape Town or Durban or Bloemfontein or wherever, and say that if this park, uh, even though it's being used by a local middle class community, actually it would be better utilized as residential space for poorer people? Is that something you would look at? As cities are the drivers of change all over the world. And that is why central to our policies we put cities and towns. And you can look at cities all over the world, from New York to Vancouver. You will see that all cities are integrated with different people living in peace and harmony. 
in those cities. I think it's wrong to think that when you bring poor people into the cities, that that will re lead to decay and all of that. Uh, yes, you get a lot of numbies, you know, a lot of people not in my backyard. But we have to persuade people that this is the best for our country. We need to integrate our country. And many of those pieces of land, uh, people, poor people used to live there many years ago, 60 years ago. But they were forcibly removed there through the Group Areas Act. So it's also incumbent on any government to bring people back to where they were before. And so we will also advocate for the, the speeding up of, of land restitution. Uh, it's, it's again an indictment on our country that so many land restitutions are, uh, claims are still outstanding. Uh, but Stephen, it, it can be done. I think we must just give it a chance. Um, instead of trying to invent excuses why it cannot happen, it must happen. And Patricia, a final issue for you tonight, this Monday evening on The Full View. I mean, a long conversation, a long dispute that you had with the Democratic Alliance that led to you leaving and uh, then forming the good party. You put your boxing gloves on at one point. There was court case followed by challenge, followed by appeal. Where are you with all of that? Are you going to drop that? Are you going to take the boxing gloves off? Or do you think there's still a little bit of time for you and the Democratic Alliance in the ring to come? Steve, I have won three court cases in the High Court um, and before I resigned I made it a point that the High Court made all of those agreement and order of the court. Uh, the Democratic Alliance have now dropped their appeal that they were going to bring to the SEA on, on, on the last judgment of the, 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 the three judges, the full bench. Um, I, I just want to go on with my life. I'm at the stage where I'm saying, oh, God forgive the fools because they did not know what they were doing. And, and, and certainly, you know, um, many people during the election campaign wanted to know from me what really went on. But lots of people were also angry the way I've been dehumanized, the way I've been treated. So it's a chapter behind me, Steve Ovo. I'm now looking forward to be part of a team that can build our country and make sure that as good people we stand together. Because if good people do nothing in our country, that is when all the evil and corruption triumph in our country. So it's uh, uh, behind me now. Patricia DeLille, thank you very much indeed. Do appreciate the time. The leader thank of you. the good